It's your girl, your host, Jocelyn, y como siempre, I'm so grateful you are here and so grateful you are tuning into this very beautiful conversation we are about to have with trauma-informed love coach and content creator, Sabrina Flores, who is just such a beautiful human. This is like the first time we're actually like meeting digitally and having a conversation, but if you follow them on TikTok or Instagram or just explore any of their work, you'll just fall in love with Sabrina. I really feel that. And if you're curious after this conversation to learn more about her and her work, definitely head on over to the links in the show notes or description below so you can check more of her out. But this conversation is basically going to be all about the healing journey, healthy relationships, and healing in healthy relationships. So I'm really excited. Sabrina, thank you so much for being here. Of course, thank you for such a warm introduction. I actually have not um, been on many podcasts yet because my schedule has been um, so overwhelmed. The transition to getting some support um, has been really helpful for me to take on new projects and get to know interesting people and have more heartwarming conversations like these. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here and chat. Beautiful. So we start all of these conversations with gratitude. So I'm inviting you to share with us what it is that you currently feel grateful for. I am happy to do that. You actually caught me at a point of such intense reflection because I was at a music festival with friends this past weekend and had so many wonderful experiences that were so eye-opening and grounding and I was actually spending so much time on the flight home yesterday reflecting on what I was grateful for and the biggest one that stands out this morning is um, the opportunity for um, to nurture female friendships. I, I feel as though there have been so many points in my life where romantic relationships, um, the curating of them, the finding of them, the growing of them has been my top priority, um, whether that's in a healthy way or an unhealthy way, um, so much so that I've really underprioritized intimacy with female friendships and um, really created spaces for them to grow in ways that um, you do your, with romantic relationships also. So I'm really grateful for the work that's done in them and the spaces that allow me to grow my femininity and gender identity within them. That's so beautiful. I love that. And I feel honestly that a lot of women are experiencing that in this moment, just like realizing how important our relationship with other women is and how they impact all of our other relationships, including our relationship with ourselves. So perhaps when when we talk about our relationship with ourself that i have planned at the end of our convo we can expand a bit more on that but i want to start straight out the gate here with you so there are people who believe and there's also content out there that says that in order to experience a healthy relationship both people have to be fully healed And there's also other people who believe and there's also content out there that says that both people don't need to be fully healed in order to experience a healthy relationship. I, to me, there was honestly a time where I felt like I needed to be fully healed in order to experience a healthy romantic partnership. But then I realized that some of the healing that I need to do is my healing surrounding relationships and romantic partnership. And the only way that I can actually do that healing is if I allow myself to experience relationships and a romantic partnership that will bring out those wounds, I guess, that I need to heal. Because there's only so much healing that we can do on our own. And I also feel like it does a, a disservice to like go on about our lives thinking like, I need to be fully healed until... I deserve to experience a healthy partnership. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about this and what you believe. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because I too get frustrated with the extremism that happens and it, and it usually comes from a good place, right? I think the people who are very passionate about saying you shouldn't be in a relationship unless you're fully healed have likely been hurt by folks who have uh, unresolved trauma coming out of every pore in their body <laughs> um, in a way that is rejecting of accountability and responsibility. And therefore, they're advocating for other people to take accountability before putting someone else in harm's way. And likewise, I think 
the other folks who advocate for the opposite, they've likely experienced lots of beautiful, healthy, healing love when they're far from it. And so their 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 opinion comes from a place of advocacy of trying to dismantle the other extreme viewpoint um, that for a time kind of permeated a lot of the dialogue on social media. But the truth is both are simultaneously correct and incorrect because like anything involving mental health or healing or relationships or anything deeply personal or spiritual, um, you, the absolutes simply do not ever paint the picture of the whole story um, because the world is not black or white. It is white. It is different shades of gray. And also the shades of gray that you see can depend on the stage of life that you're in and um, the things that you're experiencing. And so, you know, for example, I would say that you definitely don't need to be fully healed, if anything, because there is such there is no such thing as fully healed. Um, fully healed implies that you will reach a milestone, a destination where you'll wake up one morning and be like, the work is done. I'm ready to love. I'm ready to receive. I'm ready to go out and do that thing that I've always wanted to do that I couldn't do because my mental health wasn't in a good enough place. Perhaps you might be at that point for some time and it might feel very euphoric and you might feel um, perhaps all the pride and um, the excitement that you were delaying until you got to that point. But something will inevitably happen that sets you back. Um, and that's not a misstep, uh, but rather just a consequence of life. Because unfortunately, as long, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, as long as we live as human beings, we will be hurt and we will hurt other people. Not because we are unethical or unaccountable for our actions, but solely because, um, you know, we're, we are energetic beings that expend a lot of energy for a lot of different reasons. One day you might have a full cup because you had a great night of sleep and you've been eating well and you got your movement in, but perhaps you have extra conflicts happening at work and then your friend texts you uh, something that was really upsetting to hear. And then your mom is trying to get in touch with you. You have so much going on, all these deadlines, and then your partner will come home. Maybe you had two or three weeks of no conflict. Everything has been amazing. Things are finally working out. But even in that case scenario where you are set up to have as many, you know, beautiful emotional experiences that day as possible, the unpredictability of the external stressors all of a sudden is causing you to lash out because you didn't have the bandwidth for maybe your partner to say something that hurt you the wrong way, even though they didn't intend to, and therefore a conflict begins and the trigger starts. And that's for all those deep patterns that perhaps you thought you healed come out again. And then usually people think, well, that's because, you know, I wasn't fully healed. And so I thought I was, but I wasn't. So back to the drawing board. Unfortunately, what they don't realize is when you get to a point when you're finally sitting down and you're saying, okay, I've had this pattern for a very long time. It's time for it to go. How many years have you had that pattern for? Probably most of your life. Assuming that the vast majority of people have some sort of awakening to these patterns around their 20s, oftentimes a lot later, 30s, 40s, 50s even, right? Even if they do five years of really intense work, you're still trying to, you know, undo about 15 at least like plus years of deep, 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 deep unconscious pattern formation. If you think about it, like, you know, grooves in the snow, like a sled that's kind of coming down this hill up on top of this freshly laid um, hill. Every time a sled goes down, it's going to put grooves and tracks in the snow. And because it's so cold, those tracks will freeze over and it won't be as flexible, right? And then what happens when ice freezes and those tracks are kind of formulated in that ice, the next time you go down that hill, even if, you know, you want to go a certain way, let's say more to the right, if you start in the same place, more likely the sled is going to follow the same tracks that were kind of cemented into the snow, whether or not you like it. And it can take a lot of new time to basically get some new snow on the ground and then consciously choose um, new ways to do it and then allow it enough time to pass where then those tracks are cemented enough for that to be your instinctual reaction. And so when we think about healing and relationships, we have to understand that we are, are going to continuously be hurt, triggered, and put in positions where we have an opportunity to grow. And we also we have an opportunity to do something hurtful, um, which means that the thing that's important is not assessing whether or not we're healed, but assessing whether or not we are ready to take accountability and maintain accountability, even when it's really, really hard um, and, and really committing to continuously doing the work over time, even when um, 
you don't have the energy to, or perhaps it would be easier if you just allowed yourself to be sunken in that really dark place. I think that you have to have a certain level of commitment to that process in order to be in a healthy relationship, whether or not you are, you know, at point A in your healing journey or point B. Um, and both people have to be equally or at least equitably committed to that uh, and have that ingrained as one of their values as individuals and as a couple. Absolutely. And one of the things that I love that you brought up is that, you know, in our relationships, whether they're romantic or not, there is that inevitability that we are going to have moments where we're going to feel hurt and we're going to feel triggered. And one of the biggest realizations that I've had is that it's not about like trying to be in relationship with people who will never hurt you and will never trigger you. Because if you go about navigating relationships in that way, you're probably going to be cutting off a lot of people, (laughs) which I think a lot of people do like, oh my gosh, this person triggered me. Like they're not the one for me or, or, oh, this person hurt me. They're not the one for me. It's more so about finding people that you feel safe to be triggered by. Mm -hmm. And that was just one of the biggest realizations I've had. And I just felt called to share that and bring that up as you mentioned that. And it's very true because um, anything and everything can and will trigger you depending on the mindset that you're in and how vulnerable you are with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of folks, especially my audience, um, they're really surprised to hear me say that there are certain points where to a certain degree you will feel more hurt or feel more intense emotions at certain points in vulnerable, conscious, healthy relationships than perhaps you did in relationships that lacked that intimacy or maybe even that were unhealthy. Um, It's a lot easier to guard yourself and and keep the raw, really stuck fears and emotions in a box when there are more boundaries around how you act with this person. If you don't feel safe enough to share your deep, dark insecurities, your anxieties and your triggers. And so there's a lot of anxiety about, oh, how do I tell them that they're not fulfilling my needs? How do I tell them that perhaps I'm not attracted to them today and I don't want to engage in sexual intimacy today? Then, you know, there's a lot of tension around sharing, period. But when you are very safe emotionally and there's a lot of trust, um, you relax into them and usually your body knows, okay, I don't have to use all this energy. To, to hold on to all of these emotions, I can kind of let them go. And the longer you keep things suppressed, oh, the more likely they are to seep out kind of like a water bucket that's really, 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 really full. Uh, maybe you keep the water in like a closet. And so it's not really at risk for sloshing around because it's not moving. It's out of the way. There's no one to bump into it. But when you are trying to carry the bucket of water around, the, the more full it is, it doesn't matter if you walk extremely slowly and extremely carefully, like you can bump into a piece of furniture, your dog can run into it, you can trip over something and that will cause water to come out because it's filled to the brim. And that's a lot how emotions are as well. It's less about, let me find someone who doesn't trigger me. It's let me find somebody who I can trust when they tell me that their intention is not to hurt me. Um, and I feel that very deeply that l- let me let me be with someone who can trigger me. It can hold space for me as I tell them how that impacted me mm-hmm. and um, have them hear that without defensiveness or blame or um, battling me um, and then work with me to find a solution that will allow them to grow, to minimize the chance of that happening again. The emotional resilience of that is so much more important than the is this person going to hurt because it's not as black or white, you know, it's a lot of gray, like I said before. Yeah, there really is so much nuance to everything. Um, Another thing that I think a lot of people, you know, there's this difference where some people believe, and there's also a lot of content out there that's like, you know, you are the one that's responsible for your own healing and nobody else. And then there's also other people who believe and there's content out there that says like, you know, when you come into a partnership with somebody and it's committed and it's open, like there are some responsibilities that you have for your partner's healing. So I'm curious as well, like what your thoughts are on this? Like, do our partners actually have any responsibility in our healing journey? I think it's a, I think it usually depends on the type of relationship that both people are consenting to be in, right? Because I, I think a lot of people desire a partnership that um, the, where their partner helps them and takes accountability for them and where their partner you know, comes to them likewise for help and support. Um, but they don't necessarily consider what other factors need to be in place 
in order for them to have a relationship like that. Like if you want a relationship where your partner takes accountability for the things that you need and the things that you feel and helps you out with them, that's usually a partnership where there are a lot of uncomfortable conversations about lots of things like, you know, whether or not you're happy, whether or not you feel like your partner is meeting your needs, whether or not you want your partner to change their behavior. Those conversations have to happen often. Those conversations are the only way that that sort of partnership is built where a partner is saying, okay, you know what, like, let me help you out. Let me give you energy um, and time that I won't necessarily immediately get back that maybe I don't have the space for today. Let me invest this in you because I love you, because I know you're invested in me, because I know you wouldn't ask for my help unless you really needed it and it would really be helpful. And because most importantly, I know that if and when I need that from you, you will be there for me. And you know, they, they, I am able to be selfless because I know that it, that is a reciprocal commitment that we both have. Um, the part in that that's most important that I want to highlight for everybody is it's okay for your to invite your partner to help you and to ask your partner to help you as long as it is abundantly clear to all parties in the relationship that you are also carrying some of that weight. Um, there are so many times where, of course, it's easier to ask our partner for help as the first reaction to feeling hurt, scared, anxious, or triggered because we love them. It's so comfortable. It's so beautiful to, you know, have that fear soothed by someone so close to us. It, you know, feels very safe and, and childlike in a beautiful and healing way. Um, and because when you do do that alone, it brings up a lot of stuff. That immediate it's calming does not come as quickly because you have to face the loneliness, the abandonment, the rejection, the can I do this? Should I do this? How do I do this? All those questions that don't feel safe or even feasible to ask when you are feeling very, very, very overwhelmed. But the reality is, you know, even though you might know your partner will help you regulate your anxiety every single time that you're anxious, maybe because they really love you and they're really worried about you. And maybe part of their trauma is to be selfless at a detriment to them and not advocate for their own time, their own space and assess whether or not they even have the energy to help you. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should just because you can. And I think that's just true for a lot of things in life. You know, can I use their help? Yes. Would it be helpful? Yes. Do I want it? Absolutely. Should I? Can I do this alone? I don't know. I don't think so, but maybe I should try. Mm -hmm. And those are questions that you should be asking yourself extremely often because, you know, it's really important to also let our partners know that sacrifice is necessary, but you're not going to ask them to sacrifice selflessly unless it is necessary. That's also how trust is built and maintained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then when you fall into that pattern of like every time you go through something disturbing, and you turn to your partner and you get into that habit of immediately turning to your partner, then you form this like unhealthy attachment of making them. I think sometimes it could even become subconscious, like subconsciously responsible for soothing you in all of those moments. And it, it, I feel like that could end up creating tension and could like just build up a, a burden on our partner. A huge burden. And I think not even... The thing that's most burdenful, I don't even think, is the act of asking for help. It's the it's how you feel and how you're acting when you are extremely anxious and your first gut is to go to them and ask for their support or demand their support without taking a moment to assess where you're at. So for example, you know, let's say that my, you know, my best friend triggered me. Um, maybe she said something that my immediate response to is that's so inconsiderate. That's so selfish. I can't believe she did that. And my immediate thought is to release all of that intense anger, anxiety, frustration. I'm sorry, partner, can you believe that? Can you hear like what do I like, what, what do I even say to that? Like, what do I do? And your partner's, you know, first responsibility then is not to help you, but to help you calm down. Cause maybe you're from your where your partner's sitting, your partner's like, mm, well, actually. I don't, I, I don't, I feel like this maybe is misinterpreted or, you know, I, I feel like you have a point, but, you know, you've also acted that way to her, you know, this time that you told me, remember, and, you know, 
usually if that's your first the, your, your partner's first response to you when you're like ah can you believe this asshole you're not going to be very happy to hear that constructive feedback because in those moments you're looking for validation of your lived experience but when you are so unhingedly and angry and um you know you might be you know right to feel what you feel because there is no right and wrong there just is or is not but not every emotion deserves validation at the intensity at which you feel it in terms of yes it's valid that you feel this way in response to what they did validation perhaps in terms of the context like oh it's right that you feel that way because um this is one of your biggest triggers and you know when you were growing up you're really used to your family just taking advantage of you and saying really unfair things out of nowhere so i can completely understand the intensity of this emotional reaction but is this a, is it appropriate to direct that onto anybody else? Is that just? No. And so therefore, you know, in that moment, should you go to your partner first? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's best to regulate that yourself. Think about what you feel, why you feel, and then how you want to use your partner's support. Like it's a tool, it's an asset, and it should not be taken advantage of. Your partner is a living, breathing thing with you know responsibilities, with commitments, with time, and with love for you. Um, they're not a endless well of support and energy to give to you at your need and vice versa. Um, and therefore, it's really important to be responsible with what you're asking from them. It's like if my partner has X amount of energy and X amount of time to give me, to support me with this issue, how can I best make use of that energy that leaves our relationship stronger and helps reinforce our trust and our intimacy and helps me grow not just you know having them as a as a receptacle for all of my intense unregulated big scary feelings yeah i when you were sharing this i was just thinking to myself like shout out to emotional regulation like <laughs> it's so important that all of us learn this i really feel like if all of us like practiced and made ourselves and just like prioritize learning about emotional regulation and just became more emotionally intelligent specifically in that way all relationships in this world would be so much so much healthier what what would you say is like the biggest thing you're grateful to have healed in your romantic partnership so far? Current, the thing that I'm currently working on um, and I think I've made great progress in is the deep knowledge that a relationship being 50-50 is kind of a fantasy. Um, I, I think there is a lot of dialogue about, you know, you should put in what your partner puts in and if they don't put in you know the same you are entitled to feel angry and resentful and you are entitled to ask them to pull their weight or you know hey your 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 partner doesn't do the dishes it doesn't clean it doesn't do laundry you're not their mom which is all these things are true but again they're very extreme and they, and they lack a lot of nuance and and they lose consideration for the fact that if you are in a true partnership with somebody and you would consider them a partner, you would call them a partner um, and you would call them somebody that you would like to spend the rest of your life with and you would call them someone that you want to grow with, then there has to be an awareness of the fact that this life is very long. And there are going to be times when one of you is more capable to pick up more burden or more work than the other. And the important thing to consider is there should be trust that is so strong and mutual awareness that we share the same values, we share the same commitment, we share the same love. So you're not taking advantage of me. This is a season of life and the season will change. The season will change into one where I might need you to pull more weight. And so there's a deep recognition of like the, the permanence of the love and commitment and the able to perspective take with the passage of time. For example, um, my husband, for the for the past two years, um, my husband has been in a very challenging season. And so have I, I think my mental health has been, um, you know, in the, especially in the past year, uh, worse than it's ever been, but, you know, back on there. So we've both been uh, taking, you know, very, very, very big burdens for each of our own. For him though, um, 
his has been a lack of time. Um, so he was in the military. He got disabled from his work there. He the very long process of getting out. He was driving about three and a half, four hours a day to and from base. On top of that, again, his you know physical injuries were very strong. He couldn't handle a lot of you know physical labor around the house. Um, he was really depressed, and so all of these things stacked up. He kind of worked through that. Um, we were in a really nice place, and he started grad school. And so he's in grad school right now, and he's working part time. Um, so he is extremely busy. Of course, I'm extremely busy, but I have a bit more skill around time management and um, compartmentalization around my responsibilities, whereas it's more easy and more feasible for me to take care of the vast majority of the cleaning and the cooking. And on paper, people would look at that well, like, you have a job, you work more hours than him objectively. Like, just because you're a woman, he thinks that he can take advantage of you. Like, no, that's not acceptable. He should, well, you know, he actually carries more of the emotional burden in our relationship. You know, he's not really one to talk about how he feels, but he's always one to be tuning for how I'm doing. And if I'm having a mental, emotional breakdown, which happens way often, then, he, then it happens for him. He's not reactive. He's like, okay, do you, what do you need from me? How can I help? And he is more willing to stop what he's doing to help me regulate my emotions than I am for him. I don't have that skill set. Um, I, I'm, I'm still working on that. Um, and there, so there are different types of, of, of energy. And I think when people say that, you know, go 50, 50, be equal, they don't necessarily consider all types of shared labor. And likewise, you know, I often caught myself is this isn't fair. Why do I have to do this? Like he's having a little bit of free time right now. I haven't had free time yet today because I've been planning our meals and cooking. And like, why is this fair? How come he can't push himself and grind as, as much as I do, right? And you catch yourself there and you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be pushing myself this way either. Maybe I shouldn't be, you know, trying to be superwoman and pushing myself to the brink of burnout to do everything. Like, is this even feasible for me? Because sometimes, you know, maybe one person can be at 80%, the other person's at 20, but some people, sometimes you can only meet at 30. And that puts you at 60% and not 100. What do you do then? Right? Well, you sit down and you're like, well, this is where we're both at. What do we do? Like, how do we move forward today and this week so that neither of us hurt each other? That might look like, you know, revisiting our finances and saying, okay, can we change our budget to put in cleaning services weekly, biweekly? Can we change things around to afford a meal service so things are delivered? Like there are always solutions, but they are only ever able to be sought out when both people are in a place of teamwork and not reactivity. And so for me personally, that has been such a huge hump to navigate. Um, but it's been so helpful because the absence of like anger that's that spills out when I carry all that resentment around is like a it's like a the release of, of air after being choked for and stifled for so long. Like, it feels like we can actually connect more meaningfully when, you know, the thing I feel in a moment of space is not, you're a bad husband because you're not taking accountability. And rather, ooh, in this space where I'm not doing anything, I'm noticing exhaustion. I'm noticing that I've been taking more of the house responsibilities, which is okay because we're in that season of life, but I don't have the energy to do that. Hey, Brendan, what do we do today? I really don't, I really don't feel like, I really don't feel like cooking. I'm sorry. Like, can you help me prep? Can you pay for it? Can we split takeout? What are the solutions here? It's a completely different conversation that will fundamentally impact how we connect or not connect for the rest of the day. I just want to say that your openness to share your personal experiences is like your superpower or one of them. And I, I just love how when you're sharing, you're not just sharing from a place of like, this is the wisdom I've gained, but you also share example. And I feel like that's just so helpful for people. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I just had to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that your partnership with your husband is like the healthiest relationship romantic partnership that you've experienced? In, a, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Mm. Um, I think it's the most vulnerable and committed relationship I've ever been in. And in a lot of ways, that makes it, you know, the healthiest. Mm. Uh, perhaps our commitment to accountability and working things out instead of jumping to leaving 
for ending things makes it the healthiest. But in a lot of ways, we have perhaps more arguments than I've had um, in my other serious relationships. And, you know, the reason for that is reasons for that are very dynamic. Like I think my longest relationship ever was uh, for about four or five years and um, through college, uh, we barely argued ever, ever, ever. And that was partially because it was a very strong caregiver relationship dynamic. I was, you know, suffering through really intense PTSD and he completely just stopped in as like my superhero and um like just nurtured me and nurtured me and nurtured me and and so that was really the defining dynamic that we operated and there was really nothing to fight over um at all it was just i need you i need love and he's like i i have endless amounts for you i will do anything to make you feel better even if it's at a detriment to me never it was never i feel unfulfilled i feel stressed i feel like maybe you're not meeting this need oh no, she's going through so much. I can't possibly bring that to the table. Um, and then my relationship right before my husband, you know, as well was uh, very healthy, um, but they also lacked um, a lot of emotional intimacy in the way that our arguments were clinical. And that works for a lot of people and is very healthy for a lot of people. Um, but I realized that for me, it also kind of activated more insecurity than perhaps was necessary. Um, and I think that it's all about a middle ground. It's about a gray. And so when you're in an argument with your partner, yes, to a certain extent, you do want to be objective. You do want to speak slowly, articulate well, um, hold someone accountable before advancing the argument if they're acting in a way that's unfair, right? But there also needs to be empathy and softness and um, you know, perhaps awareness that something's not fair. And then the decision to hold your tongue until a more appropriate time, uh, because that is really how growth happens um, and intimacy is developed. Otherwise, you're developing perhaps like a, a track record of resolving agreements, which is valuable. But what's that doing for your relationship, really? Maybe it's preventing it from happening in the future, but is it is it helping you connect more with each other? Um, not really. And so while... You know, obviously those uh, dynamics are very different than my than my relationship with my husband because every relationship is singular in that way. Um, I would say that the introduction of more emotion um, and more love and more sacrifice and just more commitment also makes things more difficult to manage when you're both very triggered at the same time. Um, when you're both so open, like I said earlier, um, you don't have to keep that bucket of water in the closet. You can carry it around with you. And, you know, you can both pick places to like dump it out in the sink. Um, and so it's not fully sloshing around everywhere you go. But that also means since you're carrying it around more, um, it's more likely to be filled up over time. And it's also more likely to spill, uh, which means that there are going to be more small mishaps um, that might hurt more. And the frequency of hurting each other in small ways at, at times might be more. But in the long term, the long run, the grand scheme of things, um, the repair is healthier and more sustainable. For example, even like before I came on this podcast, um, my husband had came home from class and um, our AC is broken. So I'm kind of you know, like sweating and very uncomfortable. He goes in, you know, to go out of the way in his office and I have some downtime playing video games with his friends before he starts his schoolwork for the day. I'm here trying to set up running late for the podcast and my dog pees on the carpet, like right next to me. I'm like, yeah, Brennan, you're not doing anything right now. Can you please clean up the pee? He's like, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. You know, maybe like 30 seconds pass. He's not sprinting out. Now I can't set up anything until it's clean. Now, like stop now. He's like, okay, okay, okay. He's running, he sprays, um, a bottle he thought was cleaner it was just vinegar and then he does like a quick pass because I'm, I'm rushing him he's like okay, okay it's clean he runs out of the way because in the past like when he comes into the room and i'm filming i'm like what are you doing Lady, i need to get this and so he leaves i look i smell vinegar not cleaner i see it's not properly cleaned up i'm like what's your pro like what are you doing like come back and then you know he, he didn't hear me i bust into the room Can you get off the video you know and it builds and it builds and it's just pure reactivity and he comes back and he's like, please don't yell at me. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I thought it, I thought it was cleaner. I was rushing. I was trying to help. Please don't speak to me that way. Um, and 
I didn't say anything at the time because my impulse was to defend myself. Instead, I kind of stayed quiet and felt like crying and felt like intense and, you know, let the spiraling happen. What am I going to do? Oh my God, I'm going to be late. Oh my God, this sucks. This sucks. This sucks. He went back in his room. I got things set up. I sat down. I emailed you that I was going to be late. I went into my room to get something in the office and he's like, can I help you with anything else? Are you okay? And that softened me. I said, no, I'm okay. I'm sorry. He said, it's okay. And so, you know, moments like that happen so often. They happen daily. Um, and people might look at those moments in isolation and say, well, that's not a very healthy relationship if that's happening. And perhaps in a lot of ways, they're right. But I don't necessarily consider healthy versus unhealthy as, you know, a reaction. It's about, you know, how is that person reacting to your reaction? So, for example, if his reaction was one of deep hurt and like, I can't look at you the same way for that, treating me like that, then yes, of course, that's unhealthy. But because he was able to compartmentalize and because our trust is strong enough where he knows, okay, like Sabrina has, you know, has been working on her anger management for a little bit and, you know, is is very anxious. And this is a very unique time where she's trying to balance a lot. I'm not taking it personally. I just need an apology from her and we'll be okay to move on. And so in that way, it's a lot more consistently nurturing and healthy than past relationships. Yeah. I feel like you already in ways have answered this question because honestly, a lot of what you share, I feel doesn't get talked about enough, but what do you feel doesn't get talked about enough when you do experience a relationship like this, like the one that you have with your husband, like for the first time where it is committed and it is very vulnerable and it is very open. That in the best, most conscious, most beautiful loves in your life, types of love where it is a partnership where you both would do anything for each other that you're both committed to loving and growing together the love is going to look different than what you're used to than in periods of life. Um, there are so many elements of that love that are platonic and people aren't really ready for, to experience that. And when they do, they panic. Um, they think that when they experience a partnership where, oh my gosh, I found someone that will grow with me and is committed to the same things and is not going to look for an easy way out. It's going to stick things through me with thick and thin they expect the passion and the love and the lust and the attraction to also be at an all-time high because there's this euphoria that comes with this degree of emotional safety that you know you innately expect to translate into all other areas of the relationship that you also expect to stay stagnant. Um, yeah, we got here, we got to this place where we're able to trust each other and grow together. And so from this point forward, it's all up from here. Well, maybe it's all up from here, but like <laughs> improving doesn't always mean that there's the absence of argument. Sometimes it means that there's more and it gives you the opportunity to overcome that. For example, like uh, a lot of people will freak out when they realize that, oh my gosh, I don't want to have sex with my partner as much as I usually do. Or, oh my gosh, I just noticed that I'm attracted to this person in my at my work or oh my gosh um i don't know if i you know want to future with my partner anymore and these questions just the fact that they're being asked internally not even shared out loud sparks so much fear um and anxiety around like i guess i'm with the wrong person and i guess everything i've experienced or everything that i thought i experienced with this person just is not true and that's a falsehood um you when you grow with somebody and you experience the type of growth that causes that euphoria like oh my god i fully trust this person i can fully be myself around them they can fully be themselves around me you're at a, a point where it's really hard to keep going up if you're going to keep growing because what happens when you are fully comfortable with somebody you see parts of them that are unattractive and scary. Um, you release parts of yourself. You let them be naked, you know, and the way that your ugliness and your darkness interacts with their ugliness and their darkness is often not pretty justifiably. And you see your partner as this whole being that comprises light and dark. And a lot of your assumptions about them 
as this perfect, beautiful, one of a kind person who I would have never, ever, ever, ever been able to form a similar relationship with anyone else with like that idealism is shattered. Um, and as it should be, because it's just not sustainable. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, hormones will change you know, throughout your life as you grow and through the decades, as much as it will month to month for your hormonal cycle for, you know, women. And also you're pregnant, depending on your diet, if you're sick, that'll impact your mood, medications you're on, that'll impact your mood and libido, like external stressors, like your job, your family, your friends, like that'll impact your mood. That'll impact your libido. That'll impact your desire to be close and cuddly and snuggly. That'll impact both of your emotional availabilities for that. Um, and I think there is a really big need when you don't feel attracted to your partner in the same way, when you maybe don't feel sexual desire for them in the same way, maybe when you don't feel like romantic, emotional closeness with them in the same way, there's more of a desire than ever to find common ground together again and keep rebuilding instead of taking a step back and letting your relationship fall because of it. There are instances when misalignment and where you are in life do indicate that maybe you're not a good fit for each other anymore, but that shouldn't always be the first convicted like thought. Like maybe it's something that can be explored, but to have that thought and then immediately act on it and bring it up with the implication that we're just need to break up, like that's usually doing a great disservice to the energy and the and the love and the trust that you've spent putting into the relationship together. Um, you should expect to be misaligned with your partner. If not soon, then at some point. It's wildly unrealistic to think that even if you, you know, get married and have this beautiful relationship precisely because you love the same hobbies and have the exact same values and are passionate about the exact same things, like how inconsiderate and naive to, to say, this is who you are forever now, because this is who I think I'm gonna be forever. And I don't want to have to navigate a, a changing dynamic. I don't want to have to do the work to uh, figure out who we are when we are not these people. Therefore, you're not allowed to explore new parts of yourself. You're not allowed to bring those into the relationship. And you're not allowed to change. That's not feasible and that's not right. And I, and I, I don't think a lot of people feel that way, but that is what they're implying. when they say, I want you to grow. I want you to uh, change. I want you to have this journey, but only if it complements mine only if it elevates mine and only if it makes things smooth for our relationship, not feasible, not possible. Um, and therefore it's, you have to acknowledge, you know, even though we might not be connected in the same way, even though it might not be as exciting or pleasurable or fulfilling, it doesn't mean that it can't be, or it won't be. It just means that we need to sit down and figure out how else we can explore this partnership um, or, you know, how else we can explore ourselves and just, you know, be okay with this period and, and, and uh, time of distance. Yeah. There really are so many like unhealthy illusions surrounding healthy relationships, the perfect relationship that really do us such a disservice that end up having us, breaking up and ending relationships when that ending could have been avoidable. And if we don't accept all the things that you mentioned and just acknowledge the truth that like change is so inevitable in this life and we are experiencing different seasons of life consistently and those changes are going to change us and our partner and they're like who we met when we first met them they're not going to be the same we're not going to be the same so it's like you have to accept that you're going to be changing they're going to be changing and therefore the relationship is going to be changing what what do you feel is like the underlying like How do I ask this? Like, at what point do you know, like, actually, I do feel like we should end this? Like, 
It is important to not jump into conclusions when you start questioning yourself, you know, like in the moments, like you said, like, oh, I got attracted to this other person or, you know, I'm going through this difficult season. They're going through this difficult season. We're not meeting um, eye to eye. But at what point do you feel like you should actually start questioning, is this, should we actually continue to move forward? At, at the heart of it, you can tell whether or not it's time to walk away versus time to really step up and hold each other accountable to work. When you can tell with patience, the passage of time and relatively high certainty that the misalignment that you're experiencing is not a phase is not due to a temporary and sudden change in circumstances that is putting sudden stress onto the relationship um, that would potentially dissipate and resolve with time and accountability um, and rather a sign of fundamental differences that will not be changing anytime soon. Um, some considerations to keep in mind is like, despite these challenges, despite this phase of life that we're finding ourselves in right now, is the core of our relationship still strong? So if you strip away the externals that are causing stress or contributing to stress, our jobs, our hobbies, our individual passions, our individual desires even, is the core connection, the love and the respect still intact and still strong? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes like if, if you strip away the externals, you even reveal a very weak connection. And you're like, wow, I'm really thinking about it. And this person doesn't respect me because I've been asking them to make this change for months and I've been giving time because I don't want to end this and I, and I want to give us a chance to work it out. But there has been no consistent improvement despite these opportunities I've given this person, despite these numerous conversations, despite the intervention of a professional or even the offering to go to professional. And all of these things have been rejected or just not used and, and committed to with care. That's a consideration that there's a fundamental difference in your values. When of you values conscious love, growth, partnership, accountability, even when it's hard, one person is in a season of life, or maybe just the type of person where they're not willing, they're not willing to be um, selfless past a certain point. And they're not willing to put aside what they want or what their ego says that they want, what their trauma says that they want to consider the possibility that maybe they're not acting very well. Maybe they're not acting very healthily. Um, likewise, like, are you both willing to put in work that kind of ties into it? Uh, so a relationship requires two active participants. And so maybe it is a season of life. Maybe you're like, you know what? My boyfriend just started a new job. It's really stressful and it's a really unhealthy work environment. And he doesn't have a lot of friends, a lot of support. And so a lot of that is bleeding into our relationship. And I want to give him grace because I know this is temporary and I know it'll just require us to adjust. But if that temporary period is not met with willingness for your partner to be like, babe, I know that this is not healthy. I am very aware that I am affecting you in this way and this way because of my dysregulation. I don't really know what to do. Uh, I don't know where to start working on this, but like, I really want to try. Like, can, how can we do this? What do you need from me? Like, what, what, like, how, what, what do we do? Uh, you know, and if there isn't commitment to those curiosities and those desires to change from the get go, it's absolutely okay to start questioning whether or not you want to put yourself through that process of waiting. Um, it's, you know, important not to jump the gun, but it's also important not to wait so long that you put yourself due and, and, and through unnes unnecessary stress. Um, boundaries are very important in that way. Um, people often think that assertive boundaries are the same as an ultimatum. Um, there's a very fundamental distinction between them. They might both feel very intense and they both might be said with the same tone Right. But boundaries give someone a choice. An ultimatum says, like, you're not leaving me with a choice. And so like I am telling you what your options are and what the consequences are, if not. So like a boundary is some is, is basically a bridge that says, This is how I feel. This is how I'm receiving your actions. This is what I need in order to feel okay. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. How do you feel? 
What are your thoughts? How are you re- responding to this? You know, boundaries are a conversation. Boundaries say like, this is what I want and need. How can we compromise? Right? An ultimatum is after boundaries have been broken and you are no longer giving somebody the grace to have agency because the trust is dismantled. Like you give someone an ultimatum when you're like, I've, give, I've, I've stated my boundaries. I've told you how I felt and they have been continuously disrespected and disregarded. I no longer believe that you have my best interests at heart. And therefore, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I need. Or else I just don't have enough trust and faith in, in where we are right now to stick this out. Make your own choice. Ultimatums in that way are not inherently bad, but they definitely shouldn't be abused. I think they are absolutely necessary at some times. And oftentimes, like they are really what snap people back into shape because a lot of times, like really deep change and really deep work doesn't happen unless there's something on the line. Um, and this is just the human condition, right? We, at the end of the day, we're animals. We're not going to put ourselves under unnecessary stress unless we feel like it is imperative to our survival. And so sometimes, like to get through that hump, someone really needs to feel like if I don't do this, it's going to feel like I'm going to die, <laughs> but I lose my partner or my whole life shatters. And then I, you know, I have to figure things out again. Like we live together. I, I, your name's in the lease. Like, what am I going to do? So all of these things, right. Trigger some adrenaline. That's like, I guess I'm going to have to saw off my own arm if I have to, because like the, uh, the alternative is feeling like I'm dying. Like I can't. Um, and so it's, it's important. It's so important to move slowly um, and to the extent that you can with emotional regulation, openness and curiosity with both people to share what they feel and think when you're deciding whether or not you want to break up or whether or not there's a way out of this because it's really easy to make an impulsive decision that you commit wholeheartedly to in either direction. I am so glad that I asked you that question. (laughs) That was, that was so helpful. That was so helpful. Um, You're yeah. Um, There are three last topics that I want to touch on here with you. Attachment style expectations and relationship with self. Okay. From my understanding, from what I've seen on your page is that you have an avoidant attachment. I don't know if that's still true for you because I do believe that when we experience different relationships in our lives, our attachment styles and also our love languages can change. Um, What has that avoidant attachment tendency experience looked like for you and what has helped heal that? I'm so happy you said that piece, acknowledging the fluidity of attachment style, because that is something that people are very surprised to find out. Um, I think they forget that attachment styles uh, are just a theory. They're just they're just a a concept. Um, You know, there is a lot of research behind it that has been done since like the mid 1900s. And it is a very sound theory, but it is just a theory, not a law of the universe. It is a you can look at attachment styles as a way to understand your trauma and your behavior and the dynamics of your relationship. But they're a tool, not a universal law. Right. And so, of course, right? Just like anything, you know, that is a tool, it's not going to be universally applicable, which means that even though you might say like, oh, I'm an avoidant attached, avoidantly attached person, and therefore this is what I need, that might not always be true. Maybe you might feel like you're acting avoidant, but that might not accurately describe your attachment style. And in that way, um, it does change depending on the season of life that you're in. Um, And allowing yourself the flexibility to detach from the label of I am anxious, I am avoidant, also allows yourself to give yourself more grace 
and see yourself as more than just these unhealthy tendencies that negatively impact your relationship. Because that's really what people talk about when they talk about avoidant attachment, disorganized attachment, anxious attachment. It's like, here are the ways that you're not a healthy partner. <laughs> and here are the ways that you need support or need regu regulation. That's not a very optimistic or emotionally safe way to consistently see yourself. So for me personally, um, I was actually a very, 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 very anxiously attached my entire life, my entire life. I was cripplingly codependent for a very long time, like very, 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 uh, very, I was very, I was very codependent for most of my life. And as a, as a result of that, um, I didn't have any boundaries with self. It was all about how do I validate my identity and my existence and my value through receiving love in a very specific kind of way from somebody else. That stayed consistent from ages 13 to 20. Um, and when one of my long-term partners graduated from college and moved to DC, and I all of a sudden was a senior in college after being with this individual for about two years in a bubble with them, isolated from my friends because no one can be as beautiful and wonderful, as intimate as them. And what's, what's the point? What's the point of being with other people if they're not this? Oh, I just spent all my time with you. This is way more fun. I feel way better in this, in this arrangement. Um, to realizing like, it's my last year of college. My, my partner that I've basically lived with in isolation for two and a half years is gone, is in a very different phase of life. And I have nobody. I'm living alone. With like, I, I'm like, what's going on? And so that fear and that earth shattering realization of how far I've let myself go in a negative way was enough to start taking steps towards security because I didn't really have a choice. It was either wallow in my suffering or do something about it. Um, and so usually the discomfort that comes with growth is more than worth it. So I started building security and I, you know, there was a period of time when I was very securely attached and approaching it and I was stoked about it. But <laughs> when you're recovering from one extreme, it's usually very easy to swing to the other because you feel anger, right? When you experience security and friendship for the first time and you learn how to set boundaries for the first time and you learn that you're entitled to privacy with your partner and how to communicate that. You're like, how did I let this go on for so long? And you're grieving, you're grieving everything that you didn't experience. You're grieving everything that you lost and the sunk cost fallacy is crazy. And so that anger is usually enough to push you to the opposite end of the spectrum where you're overprotective of your identity. And that's what avoidance is, right? You're saying like, I am so afraid of losing myself that I'm going to keep you this far away. So it doesn't even give me the chance to harm all of this beautiful, you know, amazing stuff that I have going on for me. And so I started swinging that way. Um, and then I, you know, that relationship ended um, for, for reasons that were unrelated to my changing attachment style. And then I got into a relationship with someone who was secure leading avoidant. And so if I was in a very secure leading avoidant place in a relationship with someone who was also secure leading avoidant, it was a very secure leading avoidant relationship. Um, and that became who I was for a couple of years. And um, then I met Brendan, my husband, and he's anxious. He is a very, I wouldn't, he's definitely not codependent. He's very self-aware. He's put in so much work, but his biggest triggers are around rejection and abandonment. Um, and he is so, you know, vulnerable and open and, and, and soft that it shows very intensely when he is. And so as someone who is securely and avoidant, you know, going from dynamic A to dynamic B, I left the security and I bit like it behind me and I was just full on avoidant. And that normally happens, right? Because now I feel like, oh my gosh, there is no space. And if I tell this person I want space, now I have to do more labor to assure them that, you know, I still love them. And, you know, I, I have to take my space knowing that they're in pain and dysregulated instead of just being super chill about it. And that makes me want, you know, even more protective of, of myself. And so there have been so many times where both of us are in our respective opposite extremes. And it's very, very difficult for us to reach common ground. Um, and there's a lot of dialogue on social media as well um, from the anxious community um, where they release resentment 
towards avoidant people. And, you know, that, 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 that venting is healthy. Um, but sometimes it gets you stuck in a mindset that's not always fair. You, you always you hear often anxiously attached folks saying like, I'll never date an avoidant person. I'll, I, they are terrible people. They are unhealthy people. They just hurt and hurt and hurt. They're inconsiderate. They're selfish. Why is it always that when you want space, I have to give it to you? Why is there no consideration of mine? These are all valid things to feel. right? Because again, they have experienced so much hurt and so much abandonment from people who are very unhealthily avoidant, um, right? And because they also see attachment styles as law, you are an avoidant and nothing else, you are nothing more that describes your entire identity, right? In reality, it's about compromise, right? Like, yes, you're avoidant, it's entitled to space when they need time to regulate, um, but they are also entitled to tell you when they're going to come back. And they also should be saying, hey, I need an hour. I really need an hour. Is that okay? I don't think I can do an hour. I'm freaking out. I I I I I, I want to be sensitive to the fact that you, an hour of space might be optimal for you, but I just need you to come back as soon as you're just a little bit regulated enough to engage me in conversation. How about half an hour? Or how about you take your hour, but we're in the same room, just not speaking to each other? Like, can I like touch your knee to my knee while we like do completely different things? Like, even that would help me while you take your space. Like that's how that conversation should go. Um, and therefore, you know, it's really important when you're dealing with attachment styles, whether they're opposite or the same, to always compromise towards security, even if you're on opposite ends of the spectrum or the same end of the spectrum, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's always very different to get stuck in the, I am entitled to how I feel. And, you know, who are you to demand else, anything else from me? When in reality, like, you know, I I, I deserve to, 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 to have something that's going to help me, just like you deserve to have something that's going to help you in order to make sure that both of us get what we need. Both of us are going to have to put something in the pot and it's not going to feel good to put it in the pot. Like, hey, like, I don't want to put money in the pot. Like, I love, I prefer to save, but it's an investment, right? It's like you put some money in the pot and then what do you get? Regulation, more intimacy, growth together, you know, less arguments, less resentment. It seems like, you know, it's worth, it's worth putting something in, you know, to receive that. Um, and so when I think about how it's affected my relationship, I would, if, I would say if anything, like our opposite attachment styles have given us the biggest opportunity to grow precisely because we are both committed to growing. And so it's always, you know, the easiest to compromise when there's a lot of distance between you and the middle, right? Because there's a lot of places for you to go. Whereas like, if you're both in the same place, like you're both like, nope, I want this. You know, this is and these are the options. We have maybe like two options. Whereas, like when we're on opposite ends, like there is so much distance and gap to bridge, which can seem intimidating, but it's also really freeing, knowing that the possibilities are endless. And so, I'm really grateful um, that we've had the opportunity to overcome that together. I love that. Uh, just like highlighting, like both of you working towards security. That's that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. In your bio, you have realistic expectations for healing and healthy relationships. So I just really quickly wanted to ask you to share with us one important realistic expectation and one important unrealistic expectation that you feel should be shared. Yeah. Ooh, juicy, juicy, juicy question. I think... I think a, a realistic expectation to have is the expectation that, you know, you have to push your partner sometimes to get them to do what's right. Um, you do have to put pressure, be more stern, sometimes be a little bit more parental and your approach to getting them to do things as part of maturing, right? Like, you know, I think like as much as you want to believe that your partner or you is always going to make the mature decision the first time that's not realistic to expect. And therefore you can ask nicely, you know, with the perfect communication. Um, hey, sweetie, um, I um, I know that you had a long day at work, but I've spent a lot of time today cleaning up, doing laundry, et cetera, and cooking. I'd you know, love for you to clean. And it hurts me that I have to ask. I'd really love for you to be more proactive next time. So already this is coming from a place of, I feel like you're not pulling you know, the emotional labor that I'd like to see, but it's okay. I'm pointing it out so you can work on it. And can you please take care of this, right? Perfect communication. Your partner's like, I completely understand. Yeah, of 
course. And when I say partner, this happens to me and my husband all the time. And then you're like, cool, cool, cool. And now you're just sitting, maybe you're doing some work, you're tapping your foot, you're like, just waiting five minutes, what's he doing? You come in, you're like, Brennan, I'm like, Brennan, like, I know you don't want to do the dishes. <laughs> it like, it's your least favorite chore and I get that. Um, I'm getting really upset. Uh, I'm working right now. You're not. Um, you've had more free time than me today. And I, I, I believe that it'll get done before bed but it impacts my ability to feel safe and well in my space when I see the kitchen being a mess and I'm working from the kitchen. I don't think it's fair and I need you to do it right now. Um, it's okay to use that language sometimes to communicate the severity of a situation. Like if that's the only way you're communicating and if your partner like, you know, is not responding to that, that's usually an indication that maybe emotionally immaturity Emotional maturity is not aligned and perhaps you both need some time to consider whether or not you're going to get the relationship you want and need from this person, but it is okay. And then unrealistic expectation to have um, is that your partner will fulfill all of your needs. Uh, and that's kind of like a Pinterest quote. I feel like that's tossed around a lot, but I don't feel that like people fully sit with the depth of what that actually means. Like it means that like, you know, your partner might be great at comforting you and providing you with, you know, emotional intimacy and connection, but you might not crave their intimacy and connection when you are craving connection. Um, you might not want to spend time with them when you're free, even though you love spending time with them. You might not want to tell them how your day is going or what you're struggling with, even though you love relying on them for love and support in those times. Um, there's a lot of hurt and abandonment that comes with the expression of a boundary um, in a healthy relationship. Like, you know, babe, uh, I know that, you know, we, we really need to spend some time together this week. I agree with that. But I haven't, you know, played with my friends on, online for about like two weeks now. And um, Luke, my best friend, he's free. He's in med school. He's never free. I would love to spend time with him today. He's okay. Maybe even if we spoke about, you know, watching an episode of a TV show together, we had that verbal contract. I can I can sit there and be like, damn, like I don't have anything to do. Like I don't have anyone to hang out with. That sucks. I miss you. Like I want to see you, but that's valid. That's totally valid, and you can absolutely do that because you know your needs for connection can be met by someone else, and and it is okay for you to want to connect with someone else more than me sometimes. Um, and then holding yourself accountable to using that uncomfortable period as an as as, as a time for growth. The word that came up for me when you were sharing this was maturity. Maturity. <laughs> yeah. So important. Also, also just doesn't mean that you're not struggling and having, you know, missteps too. I think maturity is often seen as this, like you healed. You're mature when you're healed. Mm -hmm. often maturity is more of a, a mindset or an approach to resolving conflict and compromising than it is like a state of being 100% of the time. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because I feel like that's another like, quote unquote, myth of like, you're not really mature until you're fully healed, but you can absolutely be mature and healing simultaneously. The last the way that I kind of just want to bring this full circle is just talking about our relationship with ourselves, because I feel like personally, ultimately, our relationship with ourselves is the most important relationship because the way that we are in relationship with ourself will be reflected in how we're in relationship with others, how we show up for ourselves is how we end up showing up for others. Um, so I just want you to share whatever you feel inspired to share in regards to our relationship with ourself. I know in a lot of ways, when you're in love with someone beautiful in a beautiful, wonderful relationship, it fills your cup. It gives you energy. It gives you inspiration, gives you motivation, um, but that shouldn't be the only thing that is giving you energy and inspiration and motivation because that is putting a lot of pressure on one individual and one entity. What happens if the inevitable happens where they're not able to provide you with the support that you need? Where does that leave you? Uh, not in a good place usually and you cannot live or invest energy or time if your cup is empty 
Um, and I think especially when you move in with your partner, you're building a life with them and you go through that period that is normal uh, to a certain extent for everyone to experience where maybe your friendships aren't very strong and your partner is really the main person in your life that you can trust. Everyone goes through those periods sometimes. It's really hard to break yourself out of this bubble and realize when it might be getting harmful or about to be detrimental. Like, ooh, things are okay right now, but I haven't seen my friends in weeks. I haven't had a night to myself in weeks. Like I haven't, you know, gone on a on a trip by myself in in months. What does this mean for me? Um, human beings, um, they're not necessarily equipped to live in a society as distracting and overstimulating as this one. Our bodies evolved way faster than our brains could keep up with. If you think about the differences between a human being's cognition and a primate's, it's crazy. It's crazy. But how about like physically the body? It's not that different. <laughs> it's not that different. Um, and so when you think about cognitive evolution, um, it's the reason why our brains change way faster than our bodies is because when society and culture were born, things moved very fast. Like as soon as technology was a thing, like you know, written communication, like you know, governments, all of these social obligations and contracts happened. You know, you have the industrial revolution, you have capitalism, you have you know all of these inequities and all, so many things to balance that require constant attunement to, you know, am I am I going to be paid? Am I going? Our needs are more complex now, and so in a lot of ways, the way our society has evolved has rewarded a brain that can keep up with being overstimulated all the time and, and at times like reject what the body wants. I mean, hey, that's what capitalism wants. It wants you to be a working robot, right? Like who cares if you're sad and tired? Like you're never going to achieve financial freedom if you don't like grind, pick up that side hustle, get that promotion. And then so like, you know, it's this rat race and, you know, it, we learn implicitly like everything else is more important than rest. And rest can mean a lot of things, but in the context of this conversation, it also means checking in with yourself and assessing what you need and, and, and seeing like, hey, I might be in a nice grind right now and you know things might be going well and progressing towards my goals, um, but maybe I need to put that on the back burner for a little bit. Um, that's really hard because it comes with letting people down, whether that's bosses, friends, your partner, and it comes with advocating for yourself and setting boundaries. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we are, it, it is a lot easier for us to be numb and pay very little attention to what's really going on and get lost in the noise, um, right? Like it's really easy for you to be in this pattern where perhaps you are not moving your body or eating well because you're so freaking stressed all the time with so many deadlines, packed schedule, responsibilities that like, You've, you're dissociated from your body. You don't even really know the progression of your exhaustion until there's a health emergency oftentimes or a mental health emergency. Um, and the only way you can ensure stability in your mental health and your physical health and your relational well-being is if your relationship with yourself is strong enough to know I need to intervene now before it becomes a bigger issue. And despite the challenges it might introduce for me to have this hard conversation with my partner, for me to cut this friend off, for me to ask my parents to behave differently when they talk to me, if I don't, everything else will suffer. Um, and so really your relationship with yourself, it's like a, it's a platitude and a cliche to say it's the most important relationship you'll ever have um, because that might not always be true, right? Again, seasons of life change and sometimes your relationship with your child is the most important one and needs to be above yourself, right? But, you know, it is undeniably the glue that keeps all of the pieces in your life together. Um, and when not nourish, nourished and nurtured for a sustained amount of time, everything else will fall apart. 
And the acknowledgement of the universality in that truth is fundamental to like the longevity of your life and of your of your well-being. Yeah, I so appreciate everything that you've shared. Um, you're so well spoken, and I know that 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 stems from a lot of self inquiry and self awareness and self investment. So just want to acknowledge that and say like i'm proud of you for like all the work that you've put into yourself and like studying all of this and learning to be able to like have these conversations the way that you do um it's really beautiful and yeah girl you're you're meant (laughs) for for more conversations like this podcasts all of that all of that jazz for sure i I, I think I've been realizing in this season of life um, how lonely a lot of my profession is. And so I think having the opportunity to connect with a mind, a like-minded individual and um, receive space to share with immediate feedback and someone building off of it and then connecting is so nourishing and healing for me. So I really appreciate just being recognized as somebody you wanted to have on your podcast and share with your community. Um, It's such an intimate gesture to say like, I'm building this thing that I care a lot about. And I have a community of people that, you know, looks to me for guidance and community. And I think you're a safe person to invite into this space. And I, I just can't appreciate it more. I can't tell you how much it means to me. I'm truly honored. So really thank you so much for this time and this space and the opportunity to share everything. Absolutely. Um, before we get into the final five, which is just five fill in the blanks, it's super fast. I just want to hold space for you in the case that there's anything you feel called to share. Um, if not, no worries. I think the thing that I, I've been basing a lot of my content around recently precisely because I'm experiencing a, a lot of this lesson myself is um, the only thing that healing should mean to you is whether or not you're becoming more able to handle the inevitable uncertainty of life um, and to see it healing as the acquisition of awareness and a skill set and reducing the amount of time and space between trigger and response. And as long as there is a small change, even if it's like recognizing a new pattern or a new impulsive reaction that you weren't privy to before, that is healing. Even if it ended in you hurting and being reactive to somebody um, and having that open-minded stance is really the only thing that, um, that matters and likewise this this industry is so overstimulating um and oversaturating i think it, it went from being something deeply spiritual and healing itself like the self-help industry to just being a tool for money and capitalism um a lot of the people out there who are spewing extremes even if it comes from a good place right people with large platforms these are people that are, you know, seeking validation of their mindset. Um, they, they shouldn't necessarily be in a position to be sharing those deep triggered thoughts with the masses because it's just not, it's not true. Um, and it, it does more harm. And if um, social media is hurting you because there are so many extremes that contrast to your extremes or contrast to your middle ground, like unfollow um, you don't need to follow self-help people or read self-help books in order to heal. Um, people for centuries and generations have done it without them. You need a strong connection to self um, and you need a healed nervous system. And there are there are resources and gurus and professionals that have so much insight on that that are valuable. And perhaps you know you do need that for perspective, but pay close attention to the people you receive your information from and how that information makes you feel, even if it is technically correct, even if it is, you know, wonderful resources. Are you in the space to receive this and learn? Like maybe you want to improve and you want to ask yourself hard questions, but can you? 
like sometimes you just need to disconnect and feel and not be on a period where you're grinding to improve. Um, and that's okay too. And so strive for stillness more often than you strive for growth or what you think growth is. Um, because usually that's, that's the way forward. Um, in stillness, you, when you feel the hard things and the hard realizations and the hard questions come to light, and that's when the opportunity for growth is, is really presented. There are very few times where you can force true growth for a sustained period of time before it gets unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say like, there's, there's for sure growth in stillness, you know? Um, I'm so glad that I held that space because it is so important that we're checking in with ourselves in that way. And I think that also just expands on our relationship with ourselves and how important it is to like, not receive everything we see as true and everything we hear as true and checking in with ourselves and asking, does this feel true to me? Is mm -hmm. this actually serving my highest good? Is this actually expanding me? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that you shared that. So the final five are just five fill in the blanks. You can just say one word, more than one word, whatever comes to your mind. Ready? Yes. I am grateful to understand. I am grateful to understand uncertainty. Mm. I'm grateful to believe. My intuition. Mm. I am grateful to feel. A lot. Mm. I am grateful to heal. Over time. Mm. And I'm grateful to receive everything and anything that is open to be received. Mm, beautiful. Sabrina, thank you so <laughs> much for this conversation. It's so beautiful. I'm so excited to share it with everyone. You're truly such a gift. Keep doing you, listening to you, believing in your intuition. Um, yeah, you're, you're special. And I'm just grateful to have shared this space with you. Thank you so much for the affirmation. It was truly such an honor. It's very rare that I feel so safe in having these hard conversations. And I think that speaks magnitudes and volumes um, to the work that you've done and to just bring that gentleness um, into the conversations you have. So I see you and I appreciate you so much. Thank you.